Hey, any filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. I'm Nick Bodmer, and on this week's episode, we're masking out mistakes that shouldn't be in the frame, and covering up for several mistakes Griffin made in his latest video. Plus, your questions about cheap prime lenses, the difference between M4V and MOV, and what decibel level your audio should be at. Hey, Nick. Griffin Hammond. Were you surprised to hear your voice in my last non-podcast video? I was surprised, so I got a little YouTube notification that you had a new video, and what do I do when you get it, have a new video, Griffin? I watch it. That's what I do. <laughs> Especially when it's only and three I'm, and a half minutes long. <laughs> right, and I'm watching it, and then boom, Nick Bodmer, right out of nowhere. Yeah, I found, uh, I was going through old raw footage from Sriracha, and I just wanted to prove that there's a lot of times that I get the mic in the shot, and I remember you, like, tapping me and stuff, because you were running the camera yep but i didn't realize i would come across several audio clips of you actually telling me like hey get the mic out of the shot <laughs> <laughs> but now we know that that's not the end of the world right well i think by by 2013 i think i'd already had lots of experience with my own mic being in shots luckily a lot of those run tripods and i was able to just mask those out so that's what that tutorial video is about yeah, so if you haven't seen it yet, um, I'm sure we'll have a link in the show notes. You might want to go take a quick look at the video. It's very short and sweet, but a really cool tutorial. And actually a tutorial inspired by this podcast, because uh, I think maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we answered a question about that very thing, and it just made me think, I should make a whole tutorial about this trick. Yeah, and you sure make it look easy. Yeah, it really is. it really is simple, especially on a tripod. But... The thing I want to talk about today is I kind of want to go behind the scenes on that video a little bit because I okay. think it's hilarious how that video is about correcting for a mistake, like getting a mic in the shot. But in the production of that video, I made several <laughs> mistakes that I had to cover, then cover up. You know my favorite topic is you making mistakes, so right. I love it. Well, yeah, for anyone who is new to this podcast, this is episode 38, but if you go all the way back to the beginning to episode 5... It's a whole episode just on mistakes that I've made and how I correct them. <laughs> yeah, and you continue to make mistakes. That was not a joke when you said that. Right. So we have several questions that people asked about that video. So we can answer some of those, and then we'll get to some more questions later in the show. But we'll start with the okay. ones about this video. And along the way, I can share many of the things I did wrong in this video I made last week. Okay, let's do it. So first one, you got a YouTube comment from Charles. He says, great tip, but what about changing light? For example, if the sun goes behind a cloud, the light will change everywhere except for where you put the mask. Great question, Charles. Griffin, what do you do? Well, yeah, and this happened in the video I made last week. We were shooting in my living room, and the whole point was just to show that we could put a mic right in the shot, then get a clean backplate shot without the mic, mask in just the corner of the shot, and cover up the mic. But of course... It's a cloudy day, the clouds are coming and going, and the sunlight was changing in the room. So, inevitably, when I went to put in the, the plate shot, it didn't match the, the lighting conditions that had happened before. Meaning you could see the edges of the mask, is that what happens? Yeah, I would draw the mask, I'd even feather it, but it would just like, that whole space where the mic was would just be darker than the mm -hmm. space around it. And it was noticeable. Maybe not... Maybe more noticeable to me because I'm looking for it. I bet a regular lay person, if they just stumbled upon that shot, they wouldn't know that anything was wrong. They would just think the wall was kind of weirdly colored. But uh, in this case, I just went in to color correction for that masked part of the shot and just upped the brightness a little bit. And I think I had to mess with the saturation a little bit too to kind of match okay. the color saturation that was happening around it. But that was an easy fix. Okay. And you were happy with the results you still could see it or you got to the point where even you were really having a hard time seeing the edges i, I think I, I was very happy with it i think the one time you notice it i think even if you look carefully in my video there's a couple times i think at the end i wipe i do a wipe effect to get rid of the mask and bring the microphone back in and mm -hmm. i think if you look really carefully you can tell that the exposure on some parts of the wall are changing during that wipe but interesting but the great thing about this is you're never revealing the microphone in the shot if you're if you're doing this trick 
So no one will ever know. They're never going to be able to compare the before and after footage. They only know what you're showing Unlike them. Unlike this meta vet video where right. we get to see both, yeah. Yeah. And even then, I'm not terribly concerned that it looks different. It's just ever so slightly different. Cool. So, and, and a lot of people have asked... I think a lot of people have brought up this question about like weather changing and you know isn't that going to cause problems over time but i just keep thinking for interview shots the way that you normally use this kind of stuff i mean i only use an interview shot for two seconds so who cares if this thing changes dramatically throughout the video as long as i can color correct a little bit here and there uh, it's like i don't think the audience will ever see it it's not like they're ever going to be watching probably long enough have to notice multiple the opportunities to grab a plate shot right yeah, I mean, that's kind of the nice thing about when you're actually trying to keep the mic out of the frame is that, you know, you kept pushing my hand away. So <laughs> every few minutes we'd have a new clean plate. to, And that was good, too, because you were changing the, uh, during the Sriracha interviews, you were changing the zoom distance a lot. So we yep. would need a new plate every once in a while. Yep. I but thought then, it was, I mean, I couldn't believe looking at that shot of you interviewing the photographer on the mountain, like how yeah. dramatically you just put yourself in the shot and knew you'd be able to fix it. I mean, you were in like a third of the frame. Right. And I should say, I don't normally do that because uh, most of my interviews I'm shooting with, actually the lens I'm shooting this podcast of myself right now, I'm shooting with a 12 millimeter prime. That's a focal length I like for a lot of my shots. Mm -hmm. And that's wide enough that you don't have to go very far outside the the frame you don't have to be that far away with the microphone um for it to be still pretty close to the subject but when i shot ben on the mountaintop i really wanted to compress the distance between him and the mountains behind him i really wanted to make the mountains very big and massive behind him and so that just meant i was putting the camera like 10 or 15 feet away and i had the 42.5 millimeter prime on and so it just it compresses all that space so just for me to be near him i'm naturally going to be in the shot in a way that it wouldn't normally be for most of the lenses that I'm using. Interesting. And how did you make sure you didn't cross over the plane to where you were actually blocking him in the shot? Well, I just had the LCD flipped out on the camera, and even though it was pretty far away, I could just kind of keep looking back every once in a while and making sure that it looked okay. Mm, that's smart. Yeah. So we got to. I mean, it looks so from... obvious. Oh, I was, I was, it just looks so obvious when you see the shot of you in it that he's just like looking at you standing there. But then, like when I originally saw the piece, that didn't even occur to me. It's just, it's just funny the way you can manipulate things like that. Yeah. Well, and I always like to say that the audience wants to suspend a lot of disbelief when they watch video. I mean, no one wants to find your mistakes, really. Well, they I want to find your mistakes. <laughs> I mean, that is one of my goals when I watch your videos. I mean, you never watch, I mean, I think most people that are not in this industry, when they watch a documentary, they're never thinking, hey, I wonder where they put the microphones. How are they getting this audio? Yeah. You know, it's just, no one cares. So here's a YouTube comment we got from Caleb Chamberlain, who says that a method that he's often used is, because he's dealing with like moving tree leaves in the background. Uh, so what he does for his plate is he'll take the clip right after the, the mic left the shot, and then he'll time reverse it. Can you imagine why he's doing that? Just to keep the motion moving, you know, in a smooth motion without a cut? Right, yeah, he wants to be able to butt up, you know, yeah, this this cut right before the mic comes into the shot, I guess. Uh, and I, I think I even did that, I did that in this last video. When I was grabbing these plate shots, a lot of times I would, if I had to loop them, I would just put one forward, then put one version of that backwards, then one forward, then one backwards. And even though I don't think the shot is moving, that just gives me peace of mind that if it does move a little bit or something changes in the shot, it's it's going to be fluid. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. Another YouTube comment we got was from AA Entertainment, wondering if I permanently mounted a light onto my ceiling. Did you see yeah. what he's talking about? I did. So you have just a, a basically a TV studio in your apartment, right? right? <laughs> well, you've seen that I have a projector mounted on my ceiling. I have. Yep. And I was looking for an opportunity to put a backlight above me. And I I'd, I'd done a shot a, a shoot a couple weeks ago in my living room and I ended up just putting the backlight on the floor behind me. Which mm -hmm. is not the ideal placement. It's kind of creating shadows, you know, that move upward, which are strange. Uh, but it still had kind of had the effect that I wanted. But I thought if I can get this up, if I can find a place in the apartment to mount it, that'll look better. 
So I just placed the battery and the controller pack for my LED light up on top of the projector and then just taped the LED light. It's so lightweight. I just gaff taped it to the front of the projector. I wish there were a supercut of you putting your flex light in all the weird places you put it. Yeah. But here's where I'm dumb. I plugged my camera in through HDMI into my TV and it's the TV sitting right next to me during the shoot so I can see what I'm getting. Shot looks great. I do all my takes. I bring all of it into Final Cut and I realize the light is visible in all of my shots. <laughs> and you just never noticed? Well, the TV has that problem where it, like, what is it called, overscan or something? You have overscan on on your TV? I don't know. <laughs> Griffin, you're a video professional and a filmmaker, and you watch movies I guess I just TV. assume I can't even turn it off. I don't know how to turn it off on my TV. Oh, boy. That's I just disappointing. Assume, I guess I assume the plastic edges on the TV are doing part of the covering. I don't know. <laughs> how these you go into the work. settings, you can probably turn it off unless it's a really crappy TV. Yeah. Well, this is one of the few times I've used my TV as a monitor for my camera. So you have not color calibrated your TV either, oh, no. I take it? No, no. Oh, boy. Oh, you make me sad, but that's okay. That's okay. So I thought about, I don't have a clean plate, but of course what I could do is I could take this thing into Photoshop and use like content aware mm -hmm. and delete the light, make a new clean plate, a PNG in Photoshop and bring it in. But the problem is the first shot I use in the in the tutorial is the camera tilting up real quick. So it it's going to reveal the light. I don't really have a way to transition between no light and now there's a light. So you just roll with it. Yeah. Do you, can you guess what I did to get rid of it? Did you crop it? Yeah, I just cropped it. I shot the whole thing in 4K. Only had to crop it, I don't know, 20 pixels or something to get rid of it. And I'm sure that leads to some quality loss but i don't think anyone really can see i did not notice so yeah. nice job yeah i think twelve thousand people have seen it now and has 100 comments none of the comments are like hey i'm not sure this is really 4k resolution is it <laughs> <laughs> so we I got mean, a youtube comment from nick granville I've been doing this for years now, but in a much more difficult way. I take a screenshot, then remove what I want in Photoshop and save it as a PNG file. Then I overlay it back in Final Cut. I think from now on, I'll use your method. It's quicker. Yeah, I mean, I told him this is the way I used to do this. I used to be much more comfortable in Photoshop than in Premiere when I first started to edit. So I would do a lot of mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, editing something in Photoshop and then bringing it in as a PNG. But do you know why I stopped doing that? Mm. why i prefer video over still image well for the same reason as before without the uh you know when you got motion and things like that you can use video over video yeah and i'm i guess i am the main thing i'm worried about is like noise in the shot like i, mm. I don't think i thought about this much in my early days of, of editing but now that i've been using cameras enough i realize you always have noise in the shot you're trying to get the noise level down pretty low but there's always something moving around back there so to have a still image with no noise moving around masked over something that does have noise moving around a really and just because person. you're talking about digital noise in the video not sound right you're yeah talking like about grain the, the noise the grain yeah. in, in inherent in using these digital cameras yep right so yeah i don't want to cover up a whole quarter of the frame with something that isn't doing noise in fact i think i remember years ago maybe before I even fully understood noise in video, I think there was a time when I would add some noise onto a PNG because I recognized that it wasn't matching the, the look of the shot. But I did make another big mistake with my plate shot. What is that? I, so I'm doing this video. The whole point is that you get the shot with the microphone, then you get the shot without the microphone. Uh, and on my last shot that I did, you know, like the, thanks for watching everyone, I forgot to get the clean shot. I just had a mic in the entire time. You had one job, Griffin Hammond. So well, what I just, it's I, not your fault. This video that taught you how to do it didn't exist until you finished. So right. you weren't sure on the process. I just got cocky. I was like, I, I know how to do this. <laughs> Forgotten one of the steps. So did you have to pull it into Photoshop? 
Well, no. What I ended up doing is I I went back to the beginning of the of the shoot where I do have a clean plate, but of course I've shot this thing kind of in sequence. So I did like a wide shot, then a close up, then a wide shot. So I'm reframing and re-zooming. So of course the plate shot doesn't match entirely. It's framed slightly, ever so slightly differently. Sure. So I brought it in, and I've done this before. This worked this time again. I just adjusted. I think I might have had to adjust the zoom a little bit to match. I just kind of lowered the opacity on this plate shot and tried to line it up with the new shot and mess with the zoom, mess with the position until I got it right on. And then I, I then it worked. Well, again, I didn't notice, so nice job. Yeah. The only issue with that is when you line these things up differently it doesn't like it didn't go all the way to the edge so i had to make sure i cropped just enough to cover up the fact that these two things don't line up at the edge well so you made the video and only made one mistake am i right no i made another big mistake (laughs) i uh excellent (laughs) there were some there were some challenges in this video one of them being that for some reason, I set my audio levels where my mic normally is. Like, normally I would have a mic a couple feet away from me. That's where I mm-hmm. set my audio levels. And then John, who was helping <laughs> me shoot this thing, I said, hey, let's bring the mic in real close, because if we're going to edit it out, we can put it, like, an inch away from my face. Let's get the clearest audio possible. And, Did we uh, fail to monitor our audio during recording? Yeah, yeah. I trusted my audio too much. And uh, I, there were only it, it wasn't too bad. There were only a couple places in the in the whole tutorial where the audio peaked, but of course, I, I can't stand that distortion. It's unusable to me that one word that distorts. AD, did you ADR it? I did kind of. Yeah, I just took my microphone back into the living room, set my audio levels appropriately, just did like the two words again. I mean, like one of them was thanks in thanks for watching. It was just a little bit too loud, so I just went back in the living room and said. Thanks for watching, and then brought that back into the edit. Just pulled out thanks, put it over my face, saying thanks, and you never know. Put it over my face. <laughs> I actually find that I'm surprised how often I deliver lines really consistently. That I can usually just go in the other room, say a line, and I mean, even an entire line could fit. A lot of times, my footage. I have a feeling that you could probably replace "Hey, indie filmmakers" every time. And, oh, yeah. uh, and be totally fine. Yeah, people would never know when I recorded that if I recorded it at the same time <laughs> I recorded the video. Oh, and our we got another really interesting comment. This was from Mr. Matrix24, who mm-hmm. gave me an idea I wouldn't have thought of. He was wondering if we, we could do this in live video. Like, apply the mat to cover up a, a microphone in live video. I think, yes, you absolutely could, right? Yeah, I mean, I... I said, you know, in my experience, a lot of live software lets you load in graphics, logos and things, PNG files. So surely you could get a shot of your room, don't move the camera, edit something in Photoshop, bring it in as a PNG file and cover up something. Yep. I just don't know if I trust. I I think for for live video, I imagine you're going to bump your camera or something's going to move. Yeah, any movement of the camera, if the lighting changes, you know, you are going to notice that, so... Like, I'm comfortable in a 15-minute interview that I'm shooting. I could sit in the shot with Ben knowing that I'm only ever going to need to show two seconds at a time. So if I really screw this up, if I if he does move his hand behind the microphone, whatever. I won't use that part of the shot. But for a live thing, you know, if you're going for an hour, you're probably going to make a mistake somewhere. In just a moment, we're answering questions about cheap primes, the difference between M4V and MOV, and at what decibel level your audio should be at. This week, I want to encourage anyone who wants to take my documentary filmmaking class, many of you probably know about this uh, class that I've had online for a while. If anyone is interested in it, it's actually 25% off now through October 22nd. In fact, everything on Creative Live, the website where I host my my class is off is 25 percent off for the next cool. week i guess this is like a halloween sale they're doing <laughs> uh so i think normally my class costs 79 and now it's 59 i think just for a for bargain at twice the price yeah no really uh, it is a, it's a great class i mean there's a ton of content in it right it's like eight hours or something ridiculous 
Yeah, I think it's seven hours of, of lessons. I think there's 16 lessons covering everything from beginning to end of producing documentary short films. I remember watching it live, sitting in this very room I'm in now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can find that uh, in our show notes at hey.film, or it's always available at griffinhammond.com slash class. So the first question I want to talk about today is an email that we got. It's a follow-up email from Titus. Do you remember follow Titus? He, he sent in a video question where someone had stolen some of his video content. Yeah, this is the mattress guy, right? Yeah, the mattress guy. <laughs> hey, mattress guy. So we, we provided some advice on the podcast, and he has followed up to let us know what's going on. He, after talking with some friends and hearing from us, decided he should message this mattress company and say, hey, you guys used part of my video about your mattress in your commercial without my consent. Just uh, wondering why you did that. And so they wrote back. They were very apologetic, which has usually been my experience when I have this kind of situation happen to me. Uh, they said they apologized for using his video in one of their advertisements without his consent. They said that they've been working with an affiliate program to get all these review videos. And so they're kind of blaming it on a third party who made it seem like they had permission to use all this stuff and that they didn't realize they they weren't allowed to use it. Uh, the good thing is they've offered to compensate him for oh, being in, in the ad. So his big question for us is what should he ask for? He was wondering if he could get somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars for they used I think they used several seconds of one of his videos and they used it right at the beginning of one of their ads. So what do you think about that price point? I don't know. I mean I guess my my first reaction was that seems a little high, but maybe I'm not valuing his content enough. I guess I don't really I haven't seen the footage, so I don't if it's just him talking or if there's some production value or what what we're looking at from a clip perspective, but I have a feeling they might blanch at a thousand dollars. I don't know, what do you think? I think so too. And I think it's always important in these situations to realize how many con competing motives and, and backgrounds where people are coming from. As a video producer, I mean, I may say I charge $200 an hour to do work, so if it took me a few hours to make this video and they just blatantly stole some of it, then sure, they owe me hundreds of dollars, right? But, like, just knowing them, they're probably thinking, like, oh, we just we went on the internet and found someone who likes our stuff and we just took a YouTube video, like, no big deal. Like, I, I do think that they would probably balk at that, at that figure. So to help him kind of figure out what number might be good... I looked at like the cost of their mattresses, like the mattresses cost around $600, but that actually made me start to think like, well, I don't know if he was like, hey, just like reimburse me for my mattress. Maybe they'd say uh, yes. That's what my first thought was free mattress, but I guess he yeah. already has one. Yeah. The other thing they offered in the email is they were really excited to get him to be an affiliate for their product. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I looked at how much they pay affiliates for, for selling their stuff. And if he were to sure. sell a mattress, they would give him $50. Which made me think that probably so, ten mattresses worth of yeah. sales for his video is not maybe totally unreasonable, right? So I do think that sets kind of a range. I think somewhere between like five, fifty dollars and six hundred is probably where they might be comfortable. Uh, I just know that because their commercial has a lot of videos in it, and because they're all like personal, like YouTube sort of review videos, I, I even. I guess, you know, you might think that it's like a marketing agency and they're willing to spend a lot of money, but I have a feeling they're not willing to put a bunch of money into this. Although I could be wrong. Maybe they paid the marketing agency $20,000 to make this very simple Facebook ad. They probably did. <laughs> then then me maybe sad. $500 is not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Some of these some of these companies I've dealt with, they're like, oh, I don't know, $50? Like, I can't do that. And then other companies are like, oh, we are so sorry. We'll give you $5,000. So. <laughs> no one has given me $5,000. <laughs> you got to make more stuff that people want to steal for their ads. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. Hey, oh, can we time out real quick, Griffin, from questions? Yeah. We got over the 10K views on my how to shuck a hard drive video. So I want to thank everybody. For what are you that. watching? Like a live feed of your. No, of it your... happened like the next day people got it over. 
Oh, cool. It was Good. great. Remember in the in the episode, we called out and said, hey, go watch this video. Get me over 10K views because I was at like 9,900 or something. Yeah. And the audience they came through it. big time. Big Thanks. time, guys. Thank so you, I appreciate everyone. it. Yeah, that was awesome. But back to this show, uh, we have a YouTube comment from Thomas Senlarderer. Hope That's I got right. that right, Thomas. Uh, on the topic of white balances, the GH5 has two auto white balance modes. AWB auto white balance and AWB C. From what I read, they have something to do with skin tone reproduction, but there isn't much concrete information on it. If you ever use auto white balance, which one do you use? And do you know the difference between the two modes? This was something we failed to talk about last week, or I guess it's not something I really use, so I kind of skipped over it. Uh, and I don't about, recall seeing an AWBC on my camera. I don't think I have that. You on may the not have G85. it. I think it's new to the GH5 because I don't think it's on my GH4 either. Um, if I so right now I can show you uh, on my camera. I'm in custom white balance. I've set the Kelvin at 5800. Actually, can't remember what I did last week. Um, but if I switch over to auto white balance, there's AWB, and as it as I saw last week, it's very blue which is why i dial in the kelvin mm -hmm. and then here's awc which right now looks identical but of course we saw last week that the camera now is takes it a awc or awbc oh. sorry yes it's awbc yeah okay just want to make sure we had it right i think in this lighting this very blue led lighting i'm using these two settings should be roughly equivalent i'm told from panasonic that awbc stands for cool Oh. Like, you would use it in cooler lighting. No, wait, I have that wrong. You would use it in more yellow lighting because you want a more, a cooler look. I see. And I think the idea is that in a lot of auto white balance situations, you're indoors in very yellow light, and people can start to look pretty yellow, even with mm -hmm. the white balance. So I think the, the cool is just another option to, to try to make people look more normal. So not something you want to use on yourself, since you're already so pale. Yeah, I don't think I want to be cooler. So I'm going to switch back to my Kelvin setting, where I'm very yellow. And now that I'm seeing it compared to auto white balance, I'm thinking, oh, it's very yellow. But <laughs> I think it's fine. <laughs> this is why anytime right. you do uh, white balance or effects, you just got to go back and forth a lot to, to kind of make sure your eyes haven't gotten too used to the, the weird color. A, B. A, B. All right, Griffin, you want to read this email from Balaki? It's, I think it's Blake. <laughs> he, Blake shoots wedding videos, and uh, he says that everyone is chasing that elusive cinematic look. That is true. Uh, and he's wondering how to achieve that look. So he sees a lot of people talking about frame rates, shooting in 24 over 30 to make it look more cinematic. And he also wonders about adding black bars to create that super widescreen to 0.35 to 1 crop ratio. So what do you think about those two methods? Yeah, I think you got to shoot 24. I think you got to really layer on some thick bars. I think you got to <laughs> add lens the flare. Better. Thicker the better. <laughs> lens flares, right? All lens flares all the time. <laughs> Slow motion nonstop. I take it you are not into these these effects. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that is kind of basically how I do my videos is just with cheesy effects like this. But uh, no, I mean, I mean, I think... Go ahead. Well, there, there's a reason people do these things. I think there, there's, there's lots of things that look cinematic, and the most obvious ones to do are the ones that are a, a major departure from television. I mean, anytime you make something look different than, than amateur video, you're going to make it look more cinematic. So doing a super wide crop and doing 24 frames feels like the quickest way to get there. But I think you can get there in a lot of, in many other ways that don't, I think like cropping the image, you're just losing a bunch of stuff you shot. Yeah. Uh, and especially for a wedding, like that might seem cool to you, but I think the bride and groom probably want to see as much of their wedding day as possible. Yeah, like not you like just cropped grandma out the frame. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> So I do think, but if you, if, you, if you follow that line of thinking that anything that separates this from amateur video, that's what's going to make it look cinematic. Like if you do slider shots or gimbal shots, those shots always look very cinematic because they are so hard to achieve 
handheld. You, can, you I mean, you can't achieve a slider shot handheld. And so it's kind of reserved for films and, and cinematic mm-hmm. looking things. I mean, uh, anytime you do a jib shot, it always looks super cinematic because almost no one has a jib. Uh, and you never, you don't usually see zooms in a film. So avoid that, avoid handheld stuff. But mostly it's just like light it well. Like if it's well lived, it's outside, it's going to look really nice and cinematic. If it's color corrected well, you know, if there's yeah. a, you know, some artistic uh, coloring being done. But again, I think all these things can also be overused, right? We, you don't want, you don't want effects to take the place of storytelling, right? Right. And I think once i think if once you add enough pieces like if you get all the if you get the lighting right you have a nice gimbal you're using the right lenses everything's exposed properly and everything's in focus and and good audio i mean even just having good audio signals to the audience wow this is a professional project i think once you get all oh go ahead i was just gonna say the only one we forgot failed to mention that's obvious is a shallow depth of field yeah i mean arguably that's one thing that people are debate over because not Every film you watch has like super shallow depth of field, um, although it is what kind of separates amateur video, like an iPhone video, from from yeah. DSLR kind of video. But I think once you add more of these things into your into your repertoire, you can get rid of some of the ones that you would prefer not to use. Like maybe you don't want to crop anymore, and maybe you actually want to shoot in thirty frames because you like thirty. I prefer thirty now that I've been working in TV, uh, but I do think that twenty four is fine for for wedding films mm-hmm. and does kind of look cinematic here's an email we got from William who heard us talk about on the podcast that we like prime lenses and he mentioned that I think I said once on the podcast that prime lenses can be cheap and he was saying he was tr- having trouble finding a cheap prime lens like there wasn't much out there under $600 but he did find there is a 25 millimeter Panasonic lens. It's an F17, and it's like 150 dollars. Do I have that right? That looks right. Yep. Yeah. So he's wondering what we think about that. I don't think either of us have actually used this. I have F1 not used lens. that particular lens. No. I do have the F14 from Panasonic, which is a really nice, like a glass, 600 dollar lens. I tend to think that you know. As a more expensive lens, it's probably sharper than this F17, but I have a feeling the F17 is probably pretty good. I would I've, think so, yeah. I've had, you know, I had a um, a 14 millimeter prime from Panasonic that I think I got used for like 150 or something, and it was it was a great lens. Yeah, you know, I've got my 20 millimeter pancake, which I think is like 270 dollars, which is a great little walking around lens. It's very small and compact, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I bet he'll be very happy with it. And I looked at the re- reviews. I mean, everyone seems to love this lens. They probably love it because it's it's such a good bargain. Um, I do feel like I probably need to to reframe when I said prime lenses are, are cheap. I mean, prime lenses and zoom lenses can be cheap or expensive. Uh, I think generally what I was meaning was that for the money, prime lenses will get you much bigger apertures. That if yep. you're chasing aperture then prime lenses is a cheaper way to go. Just because I think if you tried to get F17 in a zoom lens, you're probably spending $1,000 or $2,000 or more. At least. Yeah. All right, we've got an email from Kieran. Kieran? I think it's just Kieran from Kieran? Scotland. I'm having trouble with names today, guys. It's, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, Kieran is a filmmaker from Scotland. I love the podcast and listen whilst traveling between jobs in the Highlands. Like you guys, I work with Final Cut Pro 10. When working with HD footage, not 4K, I will either export a 1080p version, .m4v, or export a master file, .mov. Is there any difference between the two? You'd expect the master copy to be better quality, but I can't see any difference. Also, the master copy exports much faster than the 1080p, and I have expected it to be the other way around. Relating to that question, is there any difference between .mp4, .m4v, .mov? Welcome to the lovely world of containers versus codecs. Griffin, go. Yeah. Yeah, Nick and I both know that uh, these these file extensions are just containers. They can contain 
many different codecs of video, many different compressions of video. Uh, so on the surface, there really is no difference between M4V, MOV. I mean, they can they can be a lot of different kinds of things. But in M4V, do you know where I always see these? Are you familiar with this extension? M4V? Yeah. It's an Apple extension, isn't it? Yeah. Or an Apple I think container? Yeah. You pretty much only see it with Apple stuff, but it's like, I think every, I think every iPhone video you send me is an M4V, like if you're sending it over messages or something. Yep. Uh, I think when you export from Final Cut, if you're choosing the like Apple devices preset, and I wonder if that's what Kieran is doing, you'll end up with an M4V file. Um, but it could be an MP4, it could be an MOV, it wouldn't change the, the compression. But in Final Cut, when it does master file, um, it's probably exporting a ProRes file. When you exactly. start a project in Final Cut, you can choose what render format it's in. And although Final Cut can edit natively H.264, which is a kind of compression that's very common on cameras and the internet and cable television, uh, it can edit H.264, but when you give it the choice to render and then export videos, it will always want to make them ProRes, which Apple computers are very comfortable with, and that will be an MOV file. So the reason it's going so much faster than your other one is because when you're making the M4V file, Final Cut is saying, all right, I'll take a look at this 1080 file you've edited, and now I have to compress it into a format that can play on the phone. Whereas when you say export master file, especially if you've already rendered in the background, when you hit export, it pretty much just goes, all right, let me just look at the render files I have and just copy them. And it does it very quickly. Yeah, I think what's important to know, um, ProRes is a very high quality lossless format, right? It's very fast for the computer to work with because it's not having to do a lot of advanced compression, but that means the file size is very big, right? So those. Yeah those master files are really large and not what you'd want to put up on the internet for people to have to download. Whereas when you're doing the 1080p version, which if you're getting M4V, we're saying you're probably choosing Apple devices, um, that's going through an H.264 conversion, which takes a lot longer. Now, when I export projects, I use Compressor, which I know you don't use, but I have tweaked my own export. So I actually output, um, Oh, that's a good question. What is the container of the ones I output? I mean, they are H.264, but they're not uh, M4Vs. They may still be MOVs, but with they probably H.264 are MOVs, compression yeah. inside, yeah. I believe, is what I do. Yeah, I find that uh, Final Cut likes to export MOVs in a lot of different codecs, and when I bring MOVs into uh, Adobe Media Encoder to export, it seems to like to export MP4s. But honestly, in most cases, I bet I could just change the file extension from MP4 to MOV, and I could probably still upload it to YouTube, and it probably would still figure it out. Yeah, YouTube's pretty good about that. Yeah. In fact, I'm sure I could still play it on the computer. Do you still keep a ProRes master file copy of all your projects? Not of everything. I will for things like my video last week. It's a four-minute edited video. That's when I export it as a ProRes file. It's like 15 gigs or something. It's pretty big, but not crazy to keep around, so I'll hold yeah. on to that. Whereas the podcast, I would never keep a master file of it, because I, I keep saying this on the podcast. It's not important enough to me that I would keep, <laughs> like, terabytes of podcast data. But you keep the exported MP4 version. Right, yeah. And H.264, so, I should say. Yeah, H.264, yeah. So I would encourage Kieran to open up both files that you've you've made in QuickTime, and sure, they probably do look the same because they're both decent quality. Uh, but if you hit Command-I in QuickTime, it'll pop up the little inspector with some information. And you'll be able to see, the one, the size difference. I imagine your MOV file is way bigger than the M4V. And two, you should be able to see the, uh, the codec. So one will say Apple ProRes, the other one will say H.264, and it should also say the bit rate. So you'll see that one is... I mean, Significantly the higher. <laughs> ProRes might be... I can't remember, 200 megabits per second or something. And the H.264 is probably 20 or 10 or something. Here's a Twitter question that I got from Todd, who says that he's looking at an entry-level Canon full frame. He's looking at the 6D Mark II, and he likes the idea that he'll get a bigger sensor than some of the cameras, like mine, the GH5, and 
uh, hopefully that'll allow for less noise at higher ISOs. He's saying that people have also suggested the GH5, and he knows how much people like me love it, but he just can't get his head around how a micro four third sensor can handle low light so well. That's a well, common you know, question they, I get. It is. You know, Panasonic just really has focused for a long time on video production. So you're absolutely right. It's a smaller sensor. And, you know, just going on that, you would expect better low light performance out of cameras with larger sensors. And you, you find that to be true. The Sony A7 series uh, is well known as like the low light champion. But uh, we do a lot more than just low light. So um, I think we have found, and I've tried some other brands of cameras recently that uh, the usability of the Panasonic's is just what we like. I mean, part of that is because it's what we're used to, because it's what we've been using yeah. over the years, but um, it, it really is hard to beat. Though I, I think these new Canons, people are liking quite a bit. So I, my guess is you're not gonna go wrong either way. I don't know right. particularly about the 6D, but. I mean, not everyone has the luxury to get their hands on lots of cameras, but if you have a way to try out the 6D, try out the GH5, try out the Sony, maybe you can rent these cameras before you buy. I mean, if you really don't know, I guess I'm, I feel lucky that I have been using these cameras long enough. I know that I like them. So I don't, I guess I never have this like purchase decision to figure out which brand I want. But if you try them out, um, they probably are, are all pretty good. And I just like to tell people that sensor size does impact low light performance, but not as much as you'd think. Like people freak out about sensor size when like, sure, if that's all you care about, go get a Sony a7s but if you just put a good lens on a on any camera that's going to have a lot more impact on the light performance than the sensor size sure. so if you get prime lenses everything's going to look great and uh and i think you know with these cameras you could probably go up to you can definitely go over 1600 you probably go up to 3200 or 6400 and still look pretty good in terms of noise i'm never really up that high because i have prime lenses on and i generally believe that you can chase low light all you want, but filmmaking is light. That's what makes it interesting to look at. So you could film everything in candlelight, but it's not going to look very interesting. So well, I guess might, I'm always seeking if that's out. what you're looking for. Well, I don't know. There won't be a lot of color variation, and there won't be a lot of detail. <laughs> I mean, even if you can get like the noise down, there's not a lot to look at in low-lit shots. So I'm always taking my subject to a window, and I'm always seeking out the best light I can find. Our final question today is a YouTube comment from TJ Basinger, who says that audio is his weakest skill. He says he knows that. Uh, for commercials, he generally has music and sound effects set somewhere between negative 20 dB and negative 12 decibels, and dialogue between negative 12 dB and negative 6 dB on the audio meter. He's wondering if that's too low, and he's wondering if we have any rules or workflows for setting our audio before exporting i mean just at first glance his levels sound about right to me i usually and you can tell me if i'm wrong with this or not for video but i'm shooting for around a negative six average when i'm kind of watching my playback for sa overall sound level i think you are wrong and I was wrong for a long time. In fact, I'm, I'm, I still make videos like this. I think TJ is pretty close to right. Those those sound like good, good levels. Maybe, maybe uh, dialogue could even be a little bit lower. So, I think you and I learned the same thing at some point that we want to record audio around negative six. Maybe it peaks a little bit above negative six or something. That sound, does that sound about right? Yeah, you want to give yourself a little bit of headroom so you don't clip. Right. So that's where we record audio. And I think at some point in our training, we translated that to exporting. Like we are all, we also want our levels to be around negative six when we're making You're saying video. Our, our audio is too hot in our videos? Well, yeah, I mean, this is what I was doing for years. And arguably, who cares? You know, it goes on the internet and it's fine. Uh, as long as it's not clipping, uh, it, you know, people can turn up or down their audio. But I did go to the NAB in New York, uh, conference last year and i went to a seminar with an audio mixer and he was talking about how dialogue should usually be around negative 12 db and that kind of blew my mind i was like really i all my videos are like i'm above six yeah so <laughs> my why goal is was that? always to be What's like as loud as that? possible well 
I guess you do have to think about the point of your video. Like, if you're making a film, there is a lot of range in volume. And maybe you do want to have your 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 characters speaking at around negative 12, and then your music Because that gives you room for your explosions, explosions to yeah. really, yeah, take it up a notch. All that, yeah. But arguably, yeah, if I'm only making tutorial videos, I probably do want them to be loud and clear and, you know, get the dialogue way above the music and the sound effects people can really understand what's going on so i don't know if i was ever doing it completely wrong but that just kind of changed my perspective a little bit yeah and i think you have to think about how is your audience going to consume it too right so if yours is a youtube video that's going to be watched on iphones and you know with crappy earbuds or just off an iphone speaker or a laptop speaker you have to be careful with that dynamic range because you don't have as much wiggle room, you know? Your really quiet parts are going to be really hard to hear. So I usually think about, like, you know, when I would edit wedding highlights, I would often um, edit them with Apple earbuds, which people are like, oh, my God, those sound horrible, you know? But I was like, that's, you know, how my audience is going to be consuming it. So I want to know how it sounds there. Can you hear the vows through the crappy Apple earbuds? If you can't, that's a problem. Yeah, I think that's the best advice is listening to it multiple ways on this last video i found myself editing it in nice headphones and then when i would unplug the headphones and play it on the speakers i actually found that i needed to bring the music up even higher in the headphones it was easier to hear really quiet music and really loud voice and it worked Uh, but on speakers it all gets a little bit muddier and i needed the volume to be even closer to the voice which almost seemed counterintuitive i thought like i don't want to like make it even muddier and get it you know interfere with the voice but it actually needed to be louder so i think for this last video i did i was setting i was around like negative 10 most of the time for my voice and the music was usually around negative 20 i think so what did that sum up to what was your overall meter running at it meant that the meter was usually somewhere around negative 9, negative 10, and it occasionally peaked to about negative 6. And that's about okay. the loudest the video ever got. So that's a little little quieter than I think what I shoot for on my videos. So right. I might have but to I do dial get the that sense, back a little yeah, bit. I, yeah, I get the sense that's pretty normal. Or that's where we should be aiming for. But for the podcast, I try to get that thing pretty loud. I think I'm, I'm putting us over, over negative 6 most of the video. My thinking that... I listen to a lot of podcasts in really loud environments, and a lot of times I find myself turning them up, and I sometimes podcasts are too quiet, and I need more volume out of them. And this is also a time when compressors and limiters become important, right? Because that allows us to normalize the audio level so that your quiet portions aren't too quiet based on you having the loud portions at the right volume. Right. Well, hopefully no one thinks this podcast is too loud. <laughs> No. Oh, sorry. They've just been, for for the last 49 minutes, they've just been like, man, I just need to turn so this down. <laughs> uh, that's funny. We, we just always want to be the loudest podcast on your, on your list of podcasts. The loudest podcast on the internet. <laughs> Griffin Hammond in something. <laughs> the loudest I've been thinking of anything funny to say. <laughs> Well, that's well, our does that wrap go, it up? Nick has run out of jokes. I know. It's bad, right? It's yeah. bad. But thank you all well, for, for watching thanks. our videos, for putting Nick's over 10,000, for getting my video on No Film School this week. And, How many uh, views does it have, you jerk? Oh, it's definitely got more than yours. <laughs> Let's go look. And if anyone hasn't noticed, I've been trying the last couple of weeks to do the podcast. Well, I mean, we've been doing the podcast for almost 40 weeks now. For basically uh, forever. Yeah. That's every Wednesday. And I've been trying to release a shorter video every Friday to get out two videos per week. So, so far, I've been doing that for two weeks. If you missed either my Hiding the Mic in Plain Sight video or the week before that was the Spider Light Holster review. And next this Friday, after the podcast comes out, will be a look at a new Asden mic that they let me try out, a shotgun mic. What'd you find, Nick? Griffin, I got news for you. <laughs> I am at 10,494 views. You, sir, are only at 
14,587 <laughs> views. So it's closer than I thought it would be, you know? Yeah. I'm yeah. giving you a run for the money. I mean, of course, mine's been up for months, and yours just went up like a day ago, but... <laughs> Yeah, we're not talking about that. You just got to get yours on no film school. And yours look like if it's been cropped. It's gross. <laughs> is yours even 4K? Is it? I think it is. Yeah, it probably is. Uh Oh yeah, baby. It's 4K. <laughs> is yours? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's fake 4K cuz you had to crop it. It's close enough. It's like <laughs> you're a cheater. 3700. <laughs> Alrighty, let's wrap it up. Yeah, I'll talk to you again next week. See you later, buddy. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. He's texting all the things. Oh, jeez. Why do I? I have multiple devices in here. Everything is beeping at Griffin's house. Turn off my iPad. Oh no, that's gonna be at the end of the video.